welcome to Sister Power, everyone. So happy to be here. So happy to be here. And we're going to continue the conversation um, from last time about uh, indifference of the Black family structure, the importance of self care. And, but we're going to focus more on what we deserve, we meaning what Black people deserve. And mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed the article from. Um, the author, Ta-Nehisi Coates, that okay. um, he wrote for The Atlantic, The Case for Reparation. And the case for reparation, 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, six years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policy, until we reckon with our compounding moral debt America would never be whole. Never, never. Never be whole. And so I'm going to start with you, Andre. Um, just for our viewers to just, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of the young people now who are just caring about reparations. So for our sister power viewers, what are reparations? Reparations is any kind of system that is designed to cure an injustice. Yes. Um, Lots of people have gotten in uh, reparations for um, very bad things that have happened to them in the past. Um, there was a sister who petitioned uh, the legislature of Massachusetts and received uh, le reparations back in the, the late 1700s. Um, and certainly we know about uh, the Japanese uh, Americans who received reparations for being interned uh, in concentration camps during World War II. Um, Germany has uh, paid billions of dollars in reparations uh, to Israel um, for the genocide that was um, committed uh, during uh, Hitler days um, before World War II. Um, Representative John Conyers uh, introduced a bill, Bill 40, in the United States legislature every year um, for the last uh, 40 years. John Conyers has passed away now, um, but um, the um, Black Caucus has uh, picked up and carried the ball with regard to the reparations bill. And it looks like in the wake of the George Floyd um, murder and the atrocities, we might get some traction with the reparations bill. Although the reparations bill is talking about a study a study of the area, a study of the um, arenas in which uh, discrimination has been systematically uh, applied. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, article in The Atlantic, uh, I really enjoyed that too, because he really approached it in a systematic matter. He talked about um, the FAA. Um, he talked about the New Deal that excluded um, farm workers and domestic uh, people back in the 30s from the uh, protections of the New Deal in terms of Social Security and Medicare and things of that nature. And that was a compromise that was made with the South. We'll have a New Deal, but we'll exclude farm workers and domestics. And those just happened to be the jobs that most African Americans were working in those days. But even with the uh, New Deal in terms of um, the soldiers coming back from World War II, the VA benefits. The yes. VA benefits were doled out to the state. Uh, and so uh, each soldier had to deal with their county uh, administration in order to get their educational benefits and things of that um, nature uh, approved and, and passed. And there were many, many obstacles in doing that uh, in the South. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, Reggie, I'm going to come to you. Mm -hmm. Why should I pay for reparations? You know, people are saying, my family didn't own any slaves. <laughs> what does this have to do with me? <laughs> well, it has everything to do with each individual who would be crazy enough to make such a statement because they are still beneficiaries of the acts that happened two, 300 years ago. They are direct descendants of those who wholeheartedly benefited for the forced slavery and the forced labor upon people who look like us, 
And there's no such thing as reparations without restoration. So the whole premise for reparations is the fact that you restore people to at least a reasonable portion of where they were or should have or could have been. But even as my dear brother Andre has just said, you know, even with all of the bills that have been passed, we still, it's like um, the, the Native Americans said, we still have been sold a bill of goods and they spoke with a forked tongue. Because even with everything that happened, there still was redlining. And I was just so happy. I don't know if you all read the story um, that um, well, I saw it originally on CNN and then New York Post had it of a family in New York that had actually lost all of their land, their you know, shorefront property. And this family just got $75 million. The judgment just came down for them to be able to restore their property that these people have built all these big, you know, um, resorts and everything on. But all of their property has been restored to them worth $75 million. So it has everything to do with the fact that you can't negate the fact that that leg up from two, 300 years ago is still even more substantial now because when it was worth maybe just the equivalent of like $5,000 way back then, maybe 200 years ago, you put it in today's you know, inflation rate, those, you know, the whole premise is now worth, you know, $5 trillion. So that's the, you know, whole purpose of, you know, not being able to ever say, I didn't have anything to do with it because you're still benefiting from it. Absolutely. That's correct. Uh, Absolutely. You know, the American economy was built uh, on the backs of enslaved people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we built this. We built this, this country. Yeah. We, yeah. I'm going to come to Sequoia. And just switch gears a little bit, Sequoia, um, you know, regarding fear control based correlations between stand your ground, voter suppression and violation of our first, 14th and 15th Amendment. Please elaborate. Yeah, uh, kind of even ties in with the reparations mm -hmm. in terms of how we're all connected, all these things are connected. There's a legacy of uh, systemic uh, racism and violence against black bodies. Huh. And um, it's all based in uh, fear and control, surveillance. Huh. What are we up to? What are we doing? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you there? You know, uh, when we were once property, right? Because it's all about property. Um, and property rights and protecting property. And that's what the policing is all about, right? They used to police our bodies from slave patrolling, right? And then it went to, uh, they had from like uh, going into protecting unions, right? And then it's also about property. So you have reconstruction and we're free, right? You have the 13th through 15th amendment. We're free, we have, we're, uh, you have the right to vote, right? We're supposed to have these citizens and uh, you know protection under the law and all these things, but there's resentment, right? So all of these uh, black codes started to be initiated to continue to surveil, to control resentment, fear that we're going to mess up their property because we're no longer property, but they want to still uh, keep us enslaved in a way. So then you have, uh, ways of like vagrancy laws and things that, oh, okay, now you're going back to jail. Now you're a felon who can disenfranchise you. So it goes on and on and on. And then you leave to today, you have a similar concept with these stops and frisk, um, you know, no warrant, you know, breaking into people's homes and killing them and such. So uh, there's this legacy of wanting to surveil and control our bodies based out of fear. These are people who have these hateful notions, do not want us to progress. It's white rage. And it's always when we're progressing and trying to move forward. And it ties into the voting, the voter suppression. If, if we are made a felon, 13th Amendment has that little, little clause in it, right? You're free unless you commit a crime. So yes. if you commit a crime, then you can go back into being enslaved in some kind of form or another. And like today they have like, you know, these uh, for-profit prisons. So there's just a way, it's a perpetual way of continuing on to keep us under their boots and their, under their knees, so to speak. So uh, the legacy is that we have to be on our voters' rights. We have to know what's going on, know the laws, know what's going on uh, in terms of surveilling and policing our bodies. 
and making sure we know our rights from our First Amendment right to protest to uh, our right to vote, our equal protection under the law, under the 14th. And uh, yeah, well, yeah. That's, that, that's that connection. Well, thank you. Well, you know, Andre, where does Hawaii fall on these points that uh, Sequoia is talking about our uh, first 14th and 15th Amendment? Boy, Hawaii is an, an interesting place. Um, while stuff uh, certainly does happen, um, because of the numbers of, of African Americans, you know, there aren't as many um, incidents of, of, of violence and things of that nature. It used to be that the, the police were a lot more prone to beat people up than, than shoot them. Um, although I, I had a case uh, in which a Filipino young man was um, uh, asphyxiated by three cops sitting on him. That was the uh, Aaron Torres case. Um, so basically, I would say that, you know, uh, the United States uh, is part of indigenous Hawaii. Um, Hawaii has the history of being an independent uh, brown nation. And a lot of um, African-American sailors uh, who were indeed slaves before uh, the Civil War jumped ship and stayed uh, in Hawaii. So Hawaii was a place where uh, slaves were free, like when slaves escaped to Canada and things of that nature. However, in the 1890s, when Hawaii was overthrown by um, racist uh, planters who um, basically um, took over, well, they created the newspapers. And you read some of those stories that were written in the cartoons about um, Hawaiian royalty um, because they were brown. They were denigrated as uh, incapable of uh, governing themselves, and they had to be controlled um, by the uh, um, white folks. So Hawaii has a long history of a plantation mentality. And in that plantation oh. mentality, there is a color bar kind of a range uh, that is expected in terms of who's uh, to be on top and who's to be management and who is uh, to be taking orders. Uh, oh. and, um, and we're still fighting a lot of that. Uh, the fact, though, that Hawaiians uh, are brown uh, in and of itself has, has been um, somewhat of a, of a bar against um, a real, you know, color caste system. But there is a plantation mentality in Hawaii that, that manifests itself um, through most of the systems. I mean, certainly if you look at the banking systems, um, there aren't uh, too many Black folks involved in, in banking in Hawaii. There's certainly a lot of um, real estate folks involved in real estate and some even doing well, like um, Artie Williams, Artie Wilson, and and a few others. Yeah, I think wow. Hawaii is best for African Americans who who kind of have their own business and a certain amount of independence. But at the same time, I think that people who come to Hawaii are the kind of people who like to travel and um, check out the world and and don't necessarily take somebody else's word for it. They want to check out the facts um, for themselves. But yeah. there is a civil rights battle going on in Hawaii. One of the things that disturbed me recently was listening to the 911 tape on the Lindani Miani um, emergency call. And at the beginning of the tape, uh, the lady who, who made the call um, was relatively calm. And she uh, said his name and said that he was uh, from South Africa. Um, so, I mean, there are two things there. I mean, he identified himself with his name, that he was from South Africa, and she wasn't that alarmed. As the call went on, I heard the dispatcher say, is he white? Is he white? Is he black? Is he Asian? And she repeated that many times, whereas the lady had already given the man's name and said he was from South Africa. Now, most intelligent people realize that most South Africans are indeed people of color, various colors, uh, but most of them are um, African. Yeah, thank you, Andre, on that. I wanted to get to Sequoia, uh, not only, not to Sequoia, I wanted to ask you, Reggie, mm -hmm. um, you know, silence is violence. Uh -huh. and, and Nelson Mandela said, fools multiply when wise men are silent. Yes. If, yes. if you had one, if you had to give one bit of advice to up and coming young people, what would that be? 
raise hell and take no prisoners. Um, and I say that emphatically because of the fact that you just hit the nail on the head. Remaining silent uh, has cost us already over 400 years. And knowing that our oppressors will never be our saviors, we have to, like never before, lift our voices and become outraged, not enraged, but outraged, and just say, tell, you know, we're just not going to take it anymore. Because being silent is the same thing that caused all the problems, even over in Hawaii. I mean, it just amazes me that everywhere, you know, the Caucasian race has gone, it was that sense of superiority and entitlement. And so for the young people now, I'm saying, you know what, I salute you, trying to be peaceful all the time, trying to just get along, going along to get along. That never works. And like Malcolm says, by any means necessary, like never before, because of the fact that um, the Caucasian races are becoming a minority in a few years from now, not too distant future, uh, it's just more outlandish now than it ever has been before, you know, in the history of years gone by. So I would just tell them, fight like hell and take no prisoners. I like that. Fight like hell and take no prisoners. That's it. Clear. Legacy of past um, is evident in today's stand your ground and uh. voter suppression field, advancing through mostly Republican controlled state legislation. Your thoughts? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's uh, tied in with the new, um, you can run over protesters with your car and be exempt from yeah. murder. <laughs> so what is that? That's uh, fear of us speaking our truth to power. Um, they're, they're very draconian. It's all overreaching. I find that, you know, you can just run someone over just based on like stand your ground, right? Zimmerman got away with killing Trayvon based on feeling like his life was threatened, right? So if someone feels that their life is threatened and they're in a car, they can just go up and kill you and you can walk away, you know? So it's, it's and then the person that you kill or injure would be the one that goes to jail is fined at least $3,000 or make it in a felony, you can get six years. So then going back to the voter suppression, then if you're a felon, you're in jail, you're enslaved, you are disenfranchised, you cannot vote. Hence, white supremacy, again, has another, you know, leg up. So um, it's just crazy that all those who have, uh, people of color who have used Stand Your Ground in the past, uh, was it Marissa Alexander was an example, yeah. right? Exactly. It was a domestic right. violence yeah. issue. She right. And she had to go to jail. I mean, it was yes. overturned eventually, but basically every case, maybe Andre can speak to this more, when if there's a person of color who uses Stand Your Ground, Never they works. go to jail. Yeah, well, you know, that. and then, you know, Andre, you can elaborate on that. And then we'll come back, uh, Sequoia, and talk about, you know, we'll discuss the five Ds of bystanding. But I wanted to ask Andre about going back to reparations. Why are we talking about this now? We're talking about it now because we've been talking about it forever. <laughs> because, you know, Black folks have never stopped talking about reparations. You know, it kind of rises and falls with the tide in terms of what's politically possible and, and expedient. But, um, you know, after the Civil War, people were promised 40 acres and a mule. 40 acres and a mule. got the 40 acres and a mule. And then uh, oh. Johnson, who was uh, president after Lincoln was assassinated, reversed the order. And then a lot of people's uh, property got, got taken. But some people uh, did manage to acquire some property, even though it was never uh, given and allocated and, and things of that nature. Um, my people were enslaved in Texas, at least my father's people, and were churned out with absolutely nothing. nothing. Um, that's why we didn't take the name Rogers of the jerk who um, enslaved us and, and yeah. took the name Wooten, somebody who did us a service. But um, by 1900, my great grandparents had acquired 500 acres of mm -hmm. Texas, and so the four boys got uh, 125 acres each, and um, and we've been passing that down, um, you know, for the last hundred years or so. I have 125 acres 
in Texas that my grandpa left me of my father's. And so I know the impact that the land brings. That's what sends us to college, basically. Yeah. Property is power. We yeah. still have, the, my That's grandpa it. left that farm free and clear. And oh. uh, get into the details, but if you have land, people will ask you to rent it if you're not using it. I mean, the land um, should be producing something, and it does. And that's why, you know, reparations gets into, you know, the issue of interest. You know, like if you have um, $1,000 in the bank, it used to be that you could get some interest. Um, <laughs> if you have a court case and you have a judgment, the state of Hawaii demands 10% annually uh, interest. So interest compounds. I mean, if you ever study any banking, you know, it, with the uh, compounding interest is liable to double that sum every seven years, depending upon, on, upon what that is. And so that's the wealth that slavery created. The excess wealth that slavery created funded Harvard and Yale. Yes, and yes. Brown University, they were slavers. Um, that's where the excess money comes. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, a brother got fired for breaking a stained glass window at Yale University because the window showed black people picking cotton uh, in slavery. So basically, when you look at these um, ivory tower uh, yes. schools, um, there's slavery money there. And when you look at the techniques, the business techniques that they teach in these business schools, that's where they commodified human beings. And that's yep. where they bought and sell people, certainly before the Civil War, and a lot of them still do it after the Civil War, where the human cost uh, matters not to them as long as they're making money. Um, if other people are bleeding, you know, that's not really their problem. Um, a lot of this goes back to the, the poverty of Europe, really, yep. you know, because uh, think about it. Where's the great gold mine in Europe? Where is it? You know, think about it. But you can think of great gold mines in Africa. You can think of great gold mines in the United States. There are great gold mines in Russia. But the Europeans became pirates and thieves because they did not have the resources. And that white supremacy is about... Uh, claiming the property that the natural resources that the other people of the world um, control because they live there and those things are in those lands. And yeah. so people all around the world are rising up now and demanding their rightful share of their property. But the other thing I do want to say is the techniques that won the civil rights movement um, are ineffective in this yeah. economic battle. You know, we need smart people to organize and try to take advantage of the levers of economic power that, that there are, um, like um, even in Honolulu. I mean, the city's talking about building some uh, affordable housing along the rail line. I would like to see, you know, a group of uh, African-Americans get together and um, try to um, create some housing. You'd create okay. some jobs and attack this homeless uh, problem here. Yeah, thank you on that, um, Andre. And we're going to have to do a part two, three, and four on the reparations. <laughs> uh, but, you know, very quickly, um, I'm going to want Sequoia uh, and then Reggie to close. You know, we were going to talk about the five Ds, a bystand, direct, distract, um, delegate, uh, delay, and document. But mm -hmm. Sequoia, is there anything we're leaving out here that needs to be addressed? You know, in one minute with you, Sequoia, and then Reggie, you can close us out. Okay. Well, just overall, just to bring it all together, is that all of these uh, these uh, indignities that we've been suffering for over 400 years, uh, it's been breaking down our family structure, right? And we must strengthen ourselves. We must release that um, mentality of having to put the onus on us to fight, fight, fight all the time. When this is a white supremacy problem, it's not our problem. Mm -hmm. Self-care is important. Now, when you witness things as a bystander, uh, you want to be direct, uh, check out the, ex the, uh, the situation. Is it going to be harmful to myself, to yourself or others? Um, once you get that, assess that, start distracting. 
um, Jedi mind trick, you know, bring in yeah. others around to engage the victim, ignore the perpetrator, don't engage them, right? Other things to delegate, get third parties, the people, witnesses around you to help, to like to keep it engaged, ignore the perpetrator. And then those are some, those who might be afraid, you want to maybe delay. You can't be in the moment, but maybe you go back and you uh, check in on the victim after the fact walk with that person to take them to their destination and then have and they're always be out there documenting and make sure in a Thank safe you. place to document um go to uh splc splcenter.org they have a whole listing on what you can do as a bystander thank you thank you so reggie in two minutes or less mm -hmm. give us some words of wisdom uh, my words today uh, are just based on everything. Okay, Sakura, you're right spot on with uh, everything you said, those four Ds. Um, but we have reached a point in time that we have to just understand that the reality of this whole situation regarding, you know, slavery all the way up to today, white entitlement. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather, just like um, Andre was saying, they acquired a lot of land in the Carolinas and my family had so much land. And we were always taught land is power because they can't grow no more land. And unfortunately, through generations being passed down to some of these grandchildren who had no better sense, they got rid of all this land. I never understand how you're going to get rid of your land and then have to live in an apartment that cost you more than what the home that you already owned on the land that was your family land. So my words of empowerment today are just, you know, unity is not only the key, but I keep saying to, you know, all of the younger men, I'm constantly every day, you know, trying to reach out to young brothers and sisters and letting them know we're going to need each other. So we have to first start cleaning our own house within. Now, I'm not one of those two who, you know, will let people tell me all lives matter when we talk about Black Lives Matter. And I don't let people come up and counter that by saying, well, we have to stop killing each other first. Yes, all of that is a byproduct of slavery. Keep in mind, we were the ones who, when the father was in the house, just to get welfare benefits, the father had to be put out of the house. We were the ones who were told that, like I said, a man, you know, we were just three-fifths. So when all of that comes to grip, like Malcolm, you know, said 50 years ago now, we just have to be at a point now that all hands on deck and it's time for us to stand without any fear, trepidation or hesitation and never retreat and take no damn prisoners. All right. Well, buy, well, buy black and boycott everybody. That's right. <laughs> all that's right, right everyone. Well, thank you for your wisdom, Sequoia. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, yes, Reggie. Um, I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. Aloha. Aloha, everyone.